Thank you, Felicia, for that song, Pass It On. It just takes one spark. And I trust each and every one of you is um, praying about what you want to do for missions. been working with Brother Zach this week, looking at wonderful aspects of what God's going to do, and been in contact with uh, our missionaries to spotlight them. And our first missionary in the month of June uh, will be Brother Junior Haley in Ghent, Belgium. And uh, he's already working on a video for us and looking forward to what God's going to do. Continue to be praying for them. Uh, you know, we, we don't experience the antagonistic attacks from multi-languages and multi-cultures as they do in Belgium. But it's amazing how uh, anti-religion they are. And yet Belgium is one of the few places that still have shrines and memorials set up for the Reformation. And you would think that breaking away from the Catholic Church and doing things um, and trying to get people back to Christ and Christ alone, you would think, but then you got to realize when you turn your back on God so many years ago, it gets to that point in life. And so just be praying for our missionaries as we continue on and uh, looking forward to what God's going to do as we trust that it'll be a blessing to you as you get to see them live and in color uh, and then one day uh, we're going to over the next few months we're going to talk to a possibly depending on those missionaries that are in Europe they can do it but the missionaries in North America unfortunately cannot do it but maybe one uh, Sunday morning uh, a month we'll be able to Skype them directly and you can ask them questions from the comfort of this place and talk to them in Belgium and Italy and other places that we support missionaries. And it's amazing how technology has gone, isn't it? Amen. And so let's be remembering our part in missions. Let's take our Bibles. Let's go over to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25. I want to look at the topic of the tabernacle forecast of the cross. The forecast of the cross, as you'll notice on that picture of the diagram, the beginning of the cross diagram is the altar, then you have the laver, then you have the golden candlestick, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and then the Ark of Covenant. So this morning on the forecast of the cross, I want to discuss several of the vessels that God has created to remind us of our spiritual journey. The cross, as you notice, the altar is the beginning of our journey in Christ. But in many people get to the cross, no doubt that they accept Jesus Christ, their personal Savior, but they've never gone past the cross to the labor, to the washing and regeneration of the word, nor do they ever get into the tabernacle to where they're feasting at the table of the Lord. As the Lord says, come and dine. And we never exemplify Christ in the light and we never experience the power of prayer. This is something that it is more powerful than the message. It is more powerful than anything else. And that's why God put such precedence on the altar of incense. And what's interesting is I'm going to show you this morning. It's the only vessel that touched the veil. And it was a symbolizing of earthly prayers touching a heavenly place. And this is where God made no mistakes when he did this diagram. And this is where I'm going to take you in Exodus chapter 25. And then we'll turn over to the New Testament to 2 Corinthians. But turn with me and look at your scriptures at Exodus 25 and verse 8. And he's talking to Moses here. And he's giving him instructions. And notice how he says here. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. This was not Moses saying, okay, Lord, I got my doodle paper here and I'm going to tell you what I think the tabernacle should look like. This is what I think the vessel should look like. This is, no. The Lord says, I'm going to give you the pattern. God gave us the pattern of marriage. God gave us the pattern of fellowship. God gave us the pattern how to deal with people. God gave us pattern on how to deal with the, our world. It says that we're to be caretakers of what God gives us. 
And see, God gives, this is when man says, oh God, I don't like your plan, I'm gonna do it myself. And look what happens. You might as well take a piece of paper, ball it up and throw it in the trash can. That's about as good as we're gonna get. Why? We're human. We forget. We misplace things. We, we, we have our own self-ambitions. And this is, this is the thing about life. We're human. And as they say, to error is to human. You know, we're prone to make mistakes. And God knows that. That's why he says, love one another. Forgive one another. And this is why he tells us from the very beginning, the very first tablet of stone, look what happened. They're coming down from the mound and all of a sudden, he was just gone 40 days. And they're already partying and forgetting about what went on. They forgot, and they says, oh, here's the golden idol. This is what brought us out of Egypt. They knew the golden idol didn't bring them out of Egypt. But this is what happened. And so the tablets, and he went back up for another 40 days. And this is where God gives him the blueprints for this beautiful tabernacle, his sanctuary and dwelling. But in the New Testament, we don't have that, tech, uh, that tabernacle, but we have a different tabernacle. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, please. 2 Corinthians Chapter 6. And he's talking to the Corinth church on how they are mixing their life with the world. And he says in verse 14, Be not, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with the unrighteous? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or the devil? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, or walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Christians, we are now the temple of the holy God. And he's telling the church of Corinth, he says, how can you serve idols and God? They can't exist. They can't coexist in the same temple because you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And notice what he says, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. There is the aspect of God saying, you are mine and I am yours. That is the privilege we have as Christians of having God go with us even in the worst of circumstances. He's there. And so this morning, I want to just teach you a little bit what the Bible, when God says, I'm on a pattern. Here's the perfect pattern of the tabernacle became a perfect pattern of the cross. And each vessel represented something very special in our walk with God because of the cross. Because of the cross, we have wonderful privilege as believers. We have the boldness to talk to God every day. We have the boldness to know that for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We have that confidence to know that when I close my eyes on earth, I will open them in a celestial place called heaven. We have that confidence because of the cross. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to meet in thy house as believers and as temples of the Holy Ghost. Lord, help us this morning to put aside last week, put aside tomorrow, and just relate and experience the joy of the salvation of the cross of Calvary. Help us to learn as we look at the vessels of the tabernacle. Help us to learn their pattern, their type. May we rejoice that our God left nothing unwritten and nothing untold. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. As we looked a few weeks ago, the flow of worship is very important. Just like Jesus telling everybody at the graveside of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He told everybody in John, he says, I am the door. 
I am the shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The I am's, there were seven of them, but he was trying to get to the point to where you understood, we understood, past, present, and future people would understand that there was only one way in to Christ. And this is no different in the tabernacle. He didn't make a gate on the east side, west side, south side, north side. No, he had one gate. And one gate alone. He only had one way into the temple, holy place, and one place into the Holy of Holies. There was a manner, there was a process, there was a step. It's like you getting a job. You don't just waltz in to any job you want and say, okay, I'm your new CEO. <laughs> they would look at you and say, what are you talking about, man? Did you fill out an application? Well, I didn't think I needed it. Did you, did you talk to HR? Well, no, I, I'm better than that. You know, this and that, you know, they're just a bunch of pencil pushing uh, bureaucrats. They don't know me. No, you have to go through a process, a hiring process. And then in order, if you read many of these books on these CEOs, most of them will tell you they started out as a mailroom clerk, as a boy. And we'll see it on movies. We'll see it on there where somebody's pushing mail, handing mail to each cubicle. Some of the people started out there until they built, until they got to where they were. Folks, if the secular world says, in order to be CEO, you've got to start at the ground floor to understand the company. Why is it appalling for people to say, well, how could God make it so difficult? No, he didn't. You want a job? You fill out an application. You want Christ? You go to the cross. Simple as that. But it's okay to be simple in the world. But how could God? No, God made it simple. He made patterns and types throughout the word of God for you and I to be able to follow and see. God made it so simple with the breadcrumbs of truth throughout the word of God. The very first thing, without this, can you imagine a tabernacle no longer than 60 feet, almost as long as this building, not as wide. Actually a little bit longer, 20 feet longer than this building. Half the width. Seven layers of tapestry. And the seventh layer is seal skin or whale skin. You say, why whale skin? You gotta have waterproof. <laughs> They didn't have uh, all of the uh, stuff we have today to make things waterproof. That was on the top. So therefore, in order to have that water play, waterproof membrane, it's dark. And then you add more tapestry upon more tapestry. So in that tabernacle, you had two sources of light. You had a menorah. The base was the oil reservoir, which they lit the middle one first and the others drew the oil from there how that worked I do not know it's amazing but all seven in each one of the blossoms each one of the things there's I could spend probably three and a half to four weeks just on the menorah and all the spiritual aspects of it the tabernacle is rich why it was made of gold, why it was made of brass, why it had the blossoms, why there were only seven, why, you know, there, everything was a spiritual aspect, but we're talking about the cross. So one day we'll get into the tabernacle. But that was the only light in the middle part called the holy place. Now the only other light in the holy of holies was the Shekinah glory of God. But the veil in between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. Some say that it was so dense and so thick that in order to carry it, you had to place it on a cart driven by four oxen. They would never say the weight. I cannot even guess the weight, but probably hundreds of pounds. And when the Lord rent the veil, when he passed away, and said, it is finished. He ran it from the top to the bottom. But they said that it was so strong that even oxen on both sides could not rip it, pulling on it. 
But for do the impossible thing of renting where God says no more is there a veil between heaven and earth. Because we now have a mediator. This is the golden lampstand, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense were the only three vessels, instruments as the Bible calls it, in the holy place. All were made of gold. All of the vessels on the outside were made of bronze, the symbolization of judgment on sin. And all of the inside articles were made of gold. And what's interesting, all of them were made of a wood called a Kai wood. A Kai wood was the only wood in the desert that could not and did not rot. It is symbolizing the humanity of Jesus Christ. That there was no form of any shape of decay in that man. And gold is a symbolization of deity, of God. Here is a vessel of light. And the Lord talks about, turn with me to John chapter 1 please. We're going to turn to several verses today. The gold lampstand speaks of the one who revealed the Father to us. Jesus the light giver. He is the light of men. And in John chapter 1 and verse 4. In him was life and the light was the light of men. In verse 8 and 9. He was not that light. Talking about John the Baptist. But was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. As you walk into this place, this is the only light whereby you see the bread and the altar of incense. Just imagine how bright this would have seemed. And then you go back out into the courtyard and you're almost blinded by the natural light. But this was the only light they relied on. None other. And if you think about that profound statement from a heavenly author, this was the only light they relied on to see. Isn't it amazing today we as Christians want to rely on many other lights to see what God would have us see? When we should just be relying upon Him. Look with me in John chapter 8 and verse 12 please. John chapter 8 and verse 12. Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I don't know if any of you have thought about this, but what the Lord says here, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you take a flashlight out, you usually walk like this, don't you? You can really see back there, can't you? No, you put the flashlight in front of you and you shine it in front of you so you can walk. Same way with a candlestick. You walk like this, do you not? Most of us walk like this with a candle because we're afraid we're going to blow it out. Follow me. You follow the light. You don't lead the light. You follow it. Many people say, well, you know, there's many other ways to heaven. Okay, find them. The light's behind you, not in front of you. What good would it be if your headlights were in the taillights? You know, Subaru's doing this new commercial. Many of you have seen it. Deer in the light, deer in the light. You know, the lights turn where, I always wondered why they didn't do that. But it makes sense. You go around a corner, guess what happens? Your headlights remain straight. Makes sense. To finally say, hey, when we're going in the corner and the steering wheel turns, turn the light with the car. That's the way we need to do. Sometimes we're like, Lord, I'm going over here. No, follow the light. The light keeps you out of trouble. And that's why he says, follow me. Matthew chapter 5, turn with me there. During the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord is teaching
And verse 14, chapter 5 and verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Here the Lord begins referring to us as the light. But just like this candlestick, it got its power from the oil. And let me tell you something here. In the New Testament, the oil is a symbolization of the Holy Spirit. We cannot be lit without the Holy Spirit. Many people will try to do it. And I've mentioned several times, and I forgot to bring it here, but I was going to bring my lighthouse. What happens is when we ask Jesus Christ in our heart at the foot of the cross, we have Jesus in our hearts. But sin has a problem. Sin is equated with blackness, darkness. And as we have that light, the word of God is here for the washing and regeneration of the word, the laver, as we noticed. The laver was just before you got in there. The labor was there so that we can, just like we have to wash up before we eat, we wash our hands. None of us would go to the table with, after just, just worked on a car, would we? Mom would say, go wash your nails and, you know, scrub and all that. But you're washing to get off that dirt and grime before you sit down and eat your food. Because if not, you're going to contaminate your food. And that's where the word of God is. It's there to cleanse us. But in the 18, 17, 1800s, the duty of a lights keeper was to forego all else but maintaining that light. Now, think about this. We see the solitude of a lighthouse. It just sits on a knoll, on a rock, in the middle of nowhere. One person was hired, or a family was hired, by the national government, whether it be Canada, France, anywhere else in the world, they had light keepers, were paid by the government to maintain that light. Every night, they had to make sure during the day that all that whale oil, black film was cleaned off the glass. It was arduous. It was awful. It was, they said it was just, you could not get it off. It's oil, fat. They didn't have Windex like we have. But if they would not uh, clean the glass, the light would still shine. But it would not permeate the scum. The light was still shining at the so many thousand BTUs. But the lenses was obscuring the light. And if a sailor or sailors lost their life, sadly enough, so did the lights keeper. He was charged with a loss of souls. It was his one duty to make sure no ships ran aboard. That was the, the severe penalty for the loss of life. He had one job to make sure it had light and make sure the glass was clean. Folks, every day we need to get in the word of God and be washed by the Windex of God's word. To make sure our glass is shining forth. We don't ever lose our light. It's always shining. But it can be dimmed and obscured from showing the world around us. That it was the importance. Every day they had to top up that oil. Every day that light could not go out 24 hours a day. Just as the altar outside the brazen altar, the fire from heaven lit it and it could not go out. They had to maintain it. Do you realize they had one tribe, the house of Korah, had to chop wood continually. That was their job. They just supplied the wood for that altar. And when you think about the phenomenal aspect, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is what the word of God calls the light in us. In verse 5, actually, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. 
in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure. Everybody searches for treasure, but we have it inside us. And he says, if our gospel be hid, is hid to them that are lost. If our testimony is obscured, if our light is obscured by sin, and we have not been by the way of the labor, then our light will be dim. And we might as well just be holding the flashlight behind us. It won't do any good. We need to have the light, the lamp, out in front of us so that all the world can see the Savior that made a difference in us. As we look on, have you this light? Have you taken uh, your ideas of things from the Bible and from the Spirit? Is your tabernacle partly lit by the golden lights and partly by the murky light of the world? Let us see that we have the light after the pattern on the mount. A great many Christians go astray here. They are not careful to have all their light from above. A.B. Simpson. Probably one of the most profound books that I've ever read on the tabernacle is written by A.B. Simpson. And he says, again, there was no light in the ancient tabernacle but from this. There were no windows. The candlestick was the sole illumination of God's sanctuary. So with us, dear child of God, we have no other light but God. When we trust Him, we must wholly trust Him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. When we have this light, it's the only light we'll ever need. And it's the only light the world needs. The light revealed the other objects in the holy place. It revealed to the priests the table covered with showbread. The best thing about the light was it revealed not itself, but all around. So when this light comes to us, it is not that we will gaze until we are dazzled. Rather, the light comes to show us the bread of life, the altar of incense, and the beauty of being in God's presence. The whole plan of a divine redemption becomes personal to us. The grace of Jesus Christ fills our whole beings and we wonder why we could not have taken him more fully before. Now that it seems so easy to feed on Christ and appropriate his promises into our daily journey. You have the light. The light is shining in you. The light is illuminating. The Bible says the Holy Ghost will illuminate the Word of God. You ever come to a tough passage and you're just like, man, I just don't understand this. It's just not making any sense. And you just bow your head and say, Lord, help me understand. And all of a sudden, you may walk away for a while and all, a thought will come to you, well, that makes sense. That was the Holy Ghost. That was God talking to you, illuminating the passage to you, giving you an understanding of what that verse means, of what the direction you need. The candelabra was to give light over all the vessels and instruments and the area of service inside that tabernacle. It was to show the beauty of the flowers, the pomegranate fruit, the almond bowls at the top filled with oil lighting for tabernacles. It was to show the nourishment of the bread. It was to show the splendor of the altar of incense. And it was to light the path for the feet of the priest to carry out their daily journey before God. This is our light. A picture of what the cross of Calvary leads us to. 
If it wasn't for Calvary, we'd still be in darkness. If it wasn't for Calvary, we would not have the light to light the world. But I want you to show you as the light illuminates, it illuminates directly across to the table of showbread. It is a simple little table with two staves. And it had 12 pieces of bread on it. They were circular bread. They were bread that was called leaven. Or unleavened, excuse me, had no leaven in them. They were flat bread. It was there. They were changed out the Sabbath of every week. And it was fresh put there. Each of those vials held frankincense and other spices and oils that were anointed with it. The table of showbread was made once again of a chaos wood and overlaid with gold. The wood speaks of Jesus' humanity and the gold of his deity. The bread that was placed on the table represented God's presence and nourishment in our lives. The purpose of the table was to exhibit the bread. This is what the church and the ministry are appointed to do. What lessons we may learn from this table. But many of us will look at the church and say, wow, boy, that's a nice church. They're just the vessel to deliver the word of God. They're just the vessel to deliver the word of God to the world. They're just the vessel to deliver the nourishment for this week. But it's up to us as priests and as ambassadors of Christ to come to ourselves during the week and come to the table of showbread and feast. And this is the great thing about God's word. It is open for all that seek him. As we look at the table of showbread, it was simple. It had but one use, not to show itself, but the bread. So the ministry is out of place when his brilliancy obscures the Savior. When the great Italian painter Leonardo da Vinci had finished his last supper, he showed it to a friend. And his friend exclaimed, what a beautiful job you did on the cup. The painter drew his brush over the canvas with a shadow of sorrow and began to weep. He turned to his friend. He says, I have failed. I have failed. He says, I have painted the cups, but not the Savior. For your eyes were drawn to the vessel, not the master. Many a sermon is but an exp explanation of a pictorial skill in painting cups. And the Savior is in the background. May God make us like the table, only exhibiting the bread, but not taking the focus. The table was the purpose of holding forth the bread as its offering to God, as well as for the priest's use. So the highest aim in our ministry should be to hold Christ forth for God's glory as much as for man's good. If you speak of Christ, if you live of Christ, so that God sees him in you, it is heaven enough, even if no man rejoices. Matthew 5 said, let your light so shine before men that they may glorify your works, that they may bring glory from what you did here and say, that is of God. John chapter 1, remember what he said? He is not the light, but he bore witness of the light. John the Baptist was not to be the light. He was to say, behold, the Lamb of God was taking away the sins of the world. He was pointing. He said to the people, I must decrease. He must increase. I'm not even worthy to latch his shoes. This is the aspect God is letting us learn. Let us learn the lesson of the loaves. Think about the frankincense. Loaves, they weren't ears of grain nor lumps of dough. Loaves prepared for the sole present need. It was compact, concrete, warm and simple and appropriate in quantity. Many people will say, well, what's the ingredients? Does it really matter? It tastes good. People say, well, I, what about this? What about that? When you talk to people about the Bible, they begin to say, what happened here? What happened there? 
Well, you're looking at the, the gnat. There is such a greater picture in the Word of God. So many people want to focus on what happened to the dinosaurs. They died. That's my theological opinion. They died. When? I don't know. What happened? Who did Cain marry? Well, that's easy. He married his sister. Who else would he marry? There was nobody else there. This is where you think about this. I don't know all the answers. I wasn't there 10,000 years ago. Were you? The Bible doesn't say, and if he doesn't say, I'm not going to capitalize on it because it's just an opinion. We had a Mexican fellow in our Bible college in Tabernacle, and they're saying in Mexico was everybody has an opinion like we have VW bugs. And evidently in Mexico, you have a lot of VW bugs. He said, everybody has an opinion. It's like a belly button. Everyone has one. And he always would say, I learned coming from the Catholic Church and getting saved by the glorious blood of Jesus Christ that the best answers I can have is through God's word. And that's many answers. It's, if it doesn't answer it, don't try to. God left it obscure for a reason. He didn't shine on that part of the scripture. Let it be. And this is where the table of bread was for the purpose of holding forth the bread of life. Just say, that's a good question, but this is what God says. That's a great question, but let's address your soul. Let's address, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ, your personal Savior? Take him back to the foot of the cross. That's a great question, but let's go back here. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that, but let's, what about this? Don't let the devil sidetrack you from the main purpose. Their soul needs the gospel light. If a gospel be hidden, it's him to them that are lost. Frankenstein was attractive, sweet, and appetizing so that those who should will eat and live. And what was interesting was these folks had to anoint the bread with frankincense. That's the reason they had the two vials of oil there. I've never eaten frankincense, doesn't sound appetizing, but they said on unleavened bread, it made it very moist. And you can imagine after seven days sitting out there, it probably got hard. It gave it moist, but it gave it a just an intense flavor. And I thought, wow, okay. But isn't frankincense the type of God's word? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What is all this to us? The question I can ask this morning, are you living on the bread of God or starving while in the Father's house? There is bread to spare. The sadness of the churches today is spiritual starvation. People are famished on rationalism, socialism, sensationalism, on lifeless bonds and banknotes and unwholesome pleasure. Isaiah 55 deals with this aspect. Isaiah is talking to the children of Israel. In Isaiah 55, he says in verse 2, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness are you hungry this morning Christ stands at the door and knocks he wants to enter in and sup with you he wants to have you eat with him your salvation will be meat and drink to him are you rich with the fatness of God's banquet table this morning John 6, verse 5, when Jesus lifted up his eyes and he saw a great company coming to them and said to Philip, whence shall we buy bread and these may eat? And Philip answered, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. Man looked on the physical way and said, there's just no way we can feed him. And that's when Andrew brought the young lad and says, here's five loaves and two fishes. Everybody had their fill then some. Then there was 12 baskets left over. 
He made no mistakes. Even in the wilderness, they ate manna from heaven. They were little white wafers. And he says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Jesus said unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you true bread from heaven. Then he said, Let and unto them, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And that's why he says, I am that bread of life. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. This is the bread that God gives us to be able to feast and come and dine all the time. As we move on, one of the central aspects, the very first instrument of worship when you walked in you saw was not the light was not the bread but the altar of incense right before the veil of holiness was this small 18 by 18 by about 40 inches tall a ki wood with a grate in the middle with a crown with four points that was higher than any other table any other vessel there it was called the altar of incense the position of this altar was significant for it was higher than all other things it was between two chambers it was in the earthly part but it touched the veil and as incense went into the veil to the Holy of Holies. The two chambers represented earth and heaven. The outer chamber was the believer's life in its earthly experience. Experience the light of God's word and experience the sustaining power of God's word. But this instrument represented prayer. One of the key aspects that we have I'm glad I don't have to come to you to ask you to forgive me of a sin or hear my sin aren't you I'm glad that if I sin before God I can personally go before God and say Lord I'm sorry and this is what's so important about this little vessel think about this a foot and a half by foot and a half by just over three foot not a big vessel but a powerful implication of the shadow of great things to come one day 33 AD that veil is rent top from bottom and we now have access to the holy of holies and the Hebrew says we have boldness to approach his throne I don't have to go through a priest you don't have to come to me I don't have to come to you to say, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. Jesus put that on paper. It says, you don't call no man Father. The incense was important. The altar was higher an object in the tabernacle. Several inches higher than the table. A person on his knees or her knees is more elevated than any other time. Prayer brings us to the very gates of heaven. When we are at the mercy seat, we are partially on earth and partially in heaven. For we're communing with the God of the universe. In the work of the gospel, there is no power but God's. We must trust Him and expect things we ask. The great question is this morning, what is God going to do when you bow your head in prayer it is very little matter how a person will be impressed by what a man may say whether it seems very bright or very dull but how is the Holy Spirit going to make these persons feel their need and arouse them to victory it is the Holy Spirit claimed by prayer who is the secret of success did you notice before the 
disciples were to do anything great for God, they were to go and gather themselves and pray in the upper room and ask for God to deliver them with power. And they did. Every time you see the mention of prayer in the book of Acts, shortly thereafter, God moved in a great and mighty way. Do you remember what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians? Pray without ceasing. Keep your channels open to God. Jesus said in John 15, if you ask anything in my name, I will give it. But he said, don't ask amiss in James. Sometimes we'll ask, Lord, I want this, I want that. But here's something, another key aspect. Just like the brazen altar outside had the four horns on each corner, so was this a miniature version of it to remember that our prayers should go to the four corners of the world. And the prayer of the altar of the incense that they were to put upon this altar, there could be strange fire. In other words, if they mixed that incense not according to how God said to, they were struck dead. They had to have special ingredients. They had to do it the right way. They had to grind up. They could not have any lumps, clumps, or anything else. John R. Rice said this powerful statement. He says the reason God said to grind everything up to the smallest particle was because there was no prayer too small to be offered to God. And if you were not to grind it up, that means the bigger particles would burn first because they're bigger mass. And God did not want any distinction between your aches and pains and the salvation of someone's souls. God is concerned about every little thing in your life. Take it to him. But if it's concern, he says, and the frankincense was when burnt, when these ointments were mixed together, was a sweet smelling savor. It's a very little matter. But the incense is a very important part of the altar of God. Because the aroma and the mixture, if not mixed properly. Have you ever messed around with essential oils? Try mixing some together and it's like, oh man, who died? Same thing. If you mix up frankincense with a little too much of this and a little too much of that, you won't want to be in that room for a long time. But if you do it the right amount, it smells good. It's a sweet smelling savor. As the Lord put it, it was a fire acceptable. Sometimes our prayer could be a little bit more about us instead about what God wants. And it becomes stink, stench. That's why when you see the Lord's pattern prayer, it said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It starts praising God first. And then, in the middle of the prayer, after it says, forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our debts, forgive us of this, then it says, meet our daily needs. And this is the importance about prayer. When beating up this small, God wanted to in, insinuate that when mixed properly, it would be a smell that would be pleasant to all that breathe it. And the finely powdered incense symbolizes the little needs of our life is all so important to our God. Cast your cares upon him for he careth for us. Those days when you wake up and your child's got a toothache, you got a pain and you just have had a rough night, God cares. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get through today. My head's hurting. The kids are just not right. The bills do. Cast all your cares. He wants to hear from you. He loves you. It cannot be insignificant to the very aspect of every one of these vessels. He wants to symbolize that our walk could be a very good walk in Christ. But we have to trust him. Jesus is our mediator according to 1 Timothy in Hebrews. 1 Timothy 2.5 
tells us that he is our mediator between man and God. Revelation 5.8 talks about and when he had taken the book and the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of orders which are the prayers of saints. You know the Lord has captured every one of them. Vials full. You wouldn't want to capture a bad smell would you? But the Lord is capturing all the prayers of the saints. That prayer that you breathed and said, Lord, help me, he remembers. He's got it. You may forget 10, 20 years now, but the Lord still remembers. Son, daughter, you remember that prayer? In Revelation 8, 3 and 4, another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angels' hands. Even in the temple of the holy God in heaven, there is an altar of incense. There is the altar that our prayers are being offered continually from the saints. Christians, what a privilege about these three small vessels as you see here in a drawing. The only thing wrong about the drawing was this one put the altar of incense away from the Holy of Holies. But it actually was the only vessel that was touching that veil. No mistake. And you think about the menorah, we always see the small versions of it. Folks, that thing was huge. That thing was tall. But another thing, they depicted that taller than the altar of incense, which is not. It was a few inches shorter. But still, seven candles lit that place for worship. But you know what's missing in our Christian walk? You know what's missing in the priest furniture here? There is no chair. The priests were not to be sitting. There was no chair ever made in the tabernacle of the courts. Folks, Life is too precious to sit. We're to be serving. We're to be ministering God's business around the world. We have choices. As you saw our new mission banner, pray, give, go. Well, Lord, I, I can't go. Praise the Lord, pray and give. But you know what's great about a missionary? Every missionary I know Still prays, still gives, still goes. You say, well, I'm not a missionary. Yes, you are. As soon as we leave these doors, we're walking into a mission field. All of us have the privilege of praying, giving, and going. We're not to sit, saved to sit. We're saved to serve. Because we have the light of the glorious gospel, this treasure in our body that we shine everywhere we go. The world needs some light, do you not? Look around. Tragedy after tragedy. It doesn't matter. North America has its problems. Europe has its problems. Africa has its problem. Asia has its problem. And sadly, we have the solution. And yet, because we haven't washed with the Windex of God's Word in a while, our light is dim. The hardest thing to do is scrub away that glass. The hardest thing to do is sit down and say, God, create in me a clean heart. Search me and try me. And if there be any wicked way in me, show me. The hardest thing to do is sit down and say, Lord, I need you today. But man, once we do it, it seems so easy. All we have to do is trust Him. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. But our flesh says, oh, that's impossible. Just remind your flesh that with man all things are impossible. 
but with God all things are possible. If God can turn back time on a 99-year-old lady and have her give birth, if God can give a virgin Our Heavenly Father chose Mary to be the vessel for the Son and Savior of the world. If God can choose 12 men to turn the world upside down, just think what He can do with us. We've got more knowledge, more technology than we've ever had before. But the greatest thing we need to utilize is the power of prayer. We have a world that can't withstand against the power of prayer. The Queen of Scots said of John Knox, I fear no other army, I fear no other man than the prayers of that preacher. I fear no other army, I fear no other man but the prayers of that preacher. Here is a simple preacher, John Knox, in the 1600s that made a queen of Scots afraid. For he holds the power of heaven in his lips. Wouldn't that be a great saying on a tombstone? He held or she held the power of heaven in their lips. God says we can have that. Pray without ceasing. If you ask anything in my name, I will give it. Question is, church, this morning, are we using the advantage of the cross to gain access to the food, light, and fellowship with the God of heaven? Are we utilizing the power of the light, the strength and nourishment of the bread, and the ability to get a hold of the Savior's garments. If I could just but touch the hem of his garments, that lady said, I'll be whole. If we can just but see God's power, think about your friends and family. Think about many things we could ask God and just think about what he could do. It's amazing. God can help us turn the world upside down if we but ask. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to pray? Are you willing to allow God to use you as a vessel for the bread of life and the light of the world? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask you to use this message to challenge our hearts this morning. I ask you to use the message to change us. Lord, if there is one that has been to the cross of Calvary but has never been passed, help them to walk to the washing of the water of the word and have you begin cleaning, correcting, changing. And as we walk into the holy place, help us to be that vessel of light and the vessel of bread that we may be able to offer the sweet smelling incense to the God of heaven one day Lord we'll see the vials of prayers being opened before the God of heaven and we're reminded about those hours those days those nights when darkness seemed so overwhelming and all we did was just open our heart to God and watch the light of heaven come forth thank you Lord for the privilege of prayer the privilege of having a copy of the word of God to where we can go to even in the most difficult of times as David did. To encourage us and equip us to keep pushing on, pressing on toward the mark that is set before us. 
Help us, Lord, to utilize the tools, the instruments, as you call it, in our Christian walk. Have your will and way in the invitation. In Jesus' precious name, amen.